Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, our training today on how to successfully sell at home. Um, we're fortunate to have, I guess it is four local listing brokers with us today that are going to spend the next couple hours going, that, going over that process with you. Um, my name is Justin Pochier. I'm the broker for Villa Home. We have Mike Pochier with Boardwalk Properties, as well as Caroline Gim with Expert Real Estate and Investments. And rounding out the group is David Jervis with Colwell Banker. So we're looking forward to the next uh, or this time with you. You know, as we go through this uh, uh, curriculum, we encourage you. If you have any questions, type them in the chat. Uh, we'll go ahead and answer those as we go. If there's any questions we don't get to, we'll make sure we circle back to them at the end as well. We should have a Q&A. Uh, that way we can answer any questions that you might have as well once we conclude uh, the course. Some of the items we're gonna talk about today, uh, we're gonna go over the basic HUD home overview, uh, who can buy and sell HUD homes, as well as the benefits of buying HUD homes that you can share with your clients. Um, you as an agent, uh, will go through the NAID and broker registration process. We'll cover the bidding and submitting offer process for you and your clients, um, the sp specifics of the e-signatures, and probably the most important thing in today's environment is, you know, how can you leverage HUD home where you can advertise them and actually grow your business around uh, HUD property? Now, it's kind of unique. Uh, right now, we're undergoing a change. Um, for the last decade or so, the what's known as the m and contractor, the marketing and management contractor, was BLB Resources. Uh, that contract has recently changed to a company called A-Team uh, out of Florida, and they're transitioning that contract over to them. And so we're excited to be a part of that group um, in connection with them and look forward to working with them in the process of selling their properties. Uh, in a nutshell, that's kind of where we're going to start today's uh, uh, training. And I guess I'll turn it over to our first presenter, Mike Pochi with Boardwalk Properties. Great. Thanks a lot, Justin. Appreciate it. We're, I want to, first of all, start by defining what is a HUD home. It's actually, they're not the ones that actually do the foreclosing. They actually insure the mortgage against default. The lender is the one who actually acquires the property. They submit their FHA insurance claim. And once that's settled, they convey ownership to HUD. HUD then sells the property through their asset manager. This slide will be corrected. It will be showing a team. Uh, we just don't have slides as yet. We're waiting for those to arrive, our new PowerPoint. A HUD home arena is single family, townhome, condo, or other units up to four is the typical HUD environment. Who can buy a HUD home? Virtually anybody. We don't care whether in individuals, investors, HUD approved nonprofits or government entities, all are approved to purchase HUD homes. And it doesn't matter to HUD how you buy these properties, whether you pay uh, cash or get a loan or hard money, it makes no difference. So don't think that you, it will help you by making an offer with cash and then switching it to hard money. It just slows our process down uh, and it makes no difference to HUD. The only thing HUD cares about is the highest net cash in their pocket when all is said and done. If you are gonna get financing, please, we do need a pre-qualification letter and proof of funds. Uh, prior to submitting your bid. There is a priority bidding period for owner occupants. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. I'm gonna go over some of the benefits of buying HUD homes. HUD has pre-agreed to pay up to 3% of your buyer's closing costs for owner occupants only. That's huge. And you may need it because the costs are a little bit higher for your buyer in HUD homes. Another benefit is if it's a condo or a town home, project approval is not required. That's only on HUD homes. I know your competition doesn't know that because we get calls whenever we get a listing in a complex, we'll get calls from agents constantly saying, hey, is that complex FHA approved? If HUD is offering financing in a complex and where they own a unit, they certainly have the right to waive their own requirement that the complex be FHA approved. So, and they do. So it doesn't matter whether there's litigation pending, whether there's uh, huge amounts of a uh, very high tenant occupancy ratio, whether there's a high degree of uh, HOA delinquencies, all those things will normally give you grief in getting the complex approved, makes no difference on a HUD home, okay? The IE, the insured with escrow holdback, 
is an option. It's a workaround for us to work around lender required repairs that normally need to be done before funding. We'll talk more about this just in just a little bit. As I said, there is an owner occupant priority bidding period and real low earnest money deposits, you guys. In anything over $250,001 will only require a $2,000 EMD. In fact, if you try to impress HUD by giving us 20 grand, we have to send you back to the bank to swap that out for a 2,000. I know it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but remember this is the government that we're working with here. They're real easy to work with as long as we give them exactly what they asked for, no more and no less. $2,000 EMD only, please. There is a good neighbor next door program. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. All homes are listed at hudhomestore.com and David will take us here to that website in just a little while in his portion of the presentation. There's a real quick response time for bids. Typically within 24 hours of bid deadline, you'll know whether your buyer has this is the successful bidder or not. And a lot of people aren't aware of the FHA 203K loan program. We'll talk more about that. It's a wonderful program. And as local listing brokers, we love it. We have a lot less deals fall out of escrow using this program. And as I said, it doesn't matter to HUD, to HUD how you pay for the properties, whether it's conventional, VA, FHA, cash, hard money, it makes no difference to them. All they, they only care about highest net cash in their pocket. But if you use FHA financing, they throw a couple of bonuses in at no charge to your buyer. They will automatically do a termite inspection and pay for uh, uh, remediation of that work, the active infestation only, okay? They won't do wood replacement or repair conditions that may have led to problems such as water leak or something like that, but they will do uh, active treatment, chemical treatment. They will also, on homes built before 1978, they will automatically order a lead-based paint inspection and pay for remediation up to $4,000 at no cost to your buyer. It will not affect their net. These are completely sealed bids. There's full bid transparency, you guys. You never have to worry about an unscrupulous listing agent using your offer in order to submit a bid higher in order to outbid you. It won't happen on HUD homes. As local listing brokers, we have no idea of the quantity or quality of any bids submitted. We find out who the winning bidder is the same day the winning bidder is notified. Okay, who can sell a HUD home? Anybody who's licensed can show the property. You will need a NAID, register your NAID, uh, I mean, register yourself under your broker's NAID and David will show you how to do that in his portion of the presentation. The HUD registered broker or agent must submit a bid on behalf of the owner occupant, investor, or good neighbor next door purchaser. Nonprofits and government entities are able to submit bids without using real estate broker or agent. So these are kind of an unseen portion of inventory that takes place. The ones that are shown exclusive or uh, extended or good neighbor next door are able to be represented by buyers. And, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Uh, all homes are available at hudhomestore.com. They're also listed in local MLS boards. You'll see them first at hudhomestore.com and we'll take you there in just a, a little bit here. Okay, since there is a preferential bidding period for owner occupants, we need to define in HUD's eyes who is an owner occupant. The buyers purchasing the property is their primary residence and they agree to live there for at least 12 months after close of escrow and has not purchased a HUD home as an owner occupant within the past 24 months. That equals an owner occupant and they are, their bidding period is protected. Remember this slide, would you please? There's a, it's, a, it's done in red for a reason, caution especially the guy in the lower right-hand corner, the guy in the striped suit with the ball and chain around his ankle. Remember that, okay? <clears throat> it says falsifying information regarding owner-occupant status is a felony. It's punishable by a fine not to exceed $250,000 and prison of not more than two years. And all of us, buyers, local listing brokers, and selling brokers can all be investigated by HUD. And I know you, you feel this, 
um, because of the inventory, there's still such a lack of inventory. Believe it or not, an investor may look you in the eye since they know these rules and tell you that they're going to live in it. If it doesn't make sense to you, please don't let it happen. Okay. It's just not worth it. Let's just do good, clean business. There's plenty of money out there. Okay. We're going to run through the process right now. Prior to listing, there's a field service manager who inspects the property and they ensure these properties are ready to list. Now they don't fix these things up. They kind of take some of the rough spots off. Normally they should detrash and identify some of the trip hazards um, because some of these properties, I mean, most of these properties are really not cream puffs. They're not anywhere close to being, um, you know, showing what you're used to in terms of showing status. Um, they, they need some work. Almost all of them need work to some degree or other, but once they ensure they're ready to list, then our contractor, which will be a team, uh, they order an as-is FHA appraisal. They also will order BPOs, one at least, maybe more. And they'll use some desktop valuations as an additional source of uh, value. The old days, some of you people may actually remember the, the golden feather days. They used FHA appraisal equals list price. That's not so today. In fact, that appraisal that that the m and orders is no longer released to the buyer. You've got to order your a new appraisal, even if it's an FHA, okay? So once they settle on a market price, an asking price, they'll notify us and we will list the property in the MLS. You guys show the property. We all have super lock boxes on these. They're all vacant. Uh, you submit your bid on behalf of your buyer. Uh, a team will review the bids and the winning bidder will be notified within 24 hours of bid deadline. It's really simple. I'm not gonna go through the details of the e-signature right now. We're gonna walk you through that as soon as you've been notified that you are the winning bidder. It's easy. Uh, this is the EMD requirements and Caroline will talk a little bit more about this in more depth in her portion of the presentation. Just know that the amount is only $2,000 for any purchase price of $250,001 and above. And from here on out, it's you're pretty much used to the process. Uh, you get your buyer qualified, get your inspection, recommend you get your physical inspection connected with the appraiser so that you can get utilities turned on. And we'll talk to you about that process, but the utilities can be turned on for a short time if allowable. Um, and that's one of the things you'll need to look at. And, and David will show you some of the tips in his short portion of the presentation where you'd look for disclosures that may prohibit utilities to be turned on. But if they can be turned on, try to get the timing done where your physical inspection can, be take, can take place during the same timeline as the appraiser, okay? One of the unique differences about this as opposed to other properties is that the buyer's responsible for, for rekeying after a close of escrow. We do not, we cannot give out keys to these properties. These are master keyed properties and too many people may be able to gain access. And after close of escrow, the local listing broker will remove signage and lock boxes, okay? Uh, this is HUD's timeline for their expectations for closing, depending on buyer type or finance type. They want these properties closed within 30 days for investors, regardless of finance, 30 days for cash or hard money, regardless of purchaser type, and 45 days for owner occupants using 203B or 203B with a repair escrow or conventional financing, and 60 days for owner occupants using 203K financing. Um, there are ways to get extensions and Caroline will talk to you shortly about that process. Okay. These are easy to show. They're all vacant. They all have super lock boxes. Uh, if keys are ever missing, please notify us. We'll get a key run back out to you right away. We don't want anything to get in your way of showing these properties. And the old golden feather days, like I mentioned, we used to have 
HUD keys that we would give to our investors and let them just run rampant and look at properties, let us know what they wanted to offer on that. Those days are gone. You must be present with your purchaser, with your buyer on all showings. You can't let them go through these properties on their own, okay? All showings are subject to the state's COVID-19 orders. This is relaxing a little bit, but uh, normally we're still under guidelines to one degree or, or another. Uh, there are different finance types. You've probably heard us um, refer to these from time to time. There's four basic types. The first two are more owner-occupant driven. They're the insurable. This is as good as they get. They qualify for 203B financing. In their present condition, they have no minimum property requirement repairs. So they qualify for 203B as is, as they sit. They may also qualify for 203K financing if your buyer would like to do some rehab to the property. Then there's the insurable with escrow. This is the next category. And this is where we see most properties fall is the IE. They qualify for 203B with a repair escrow. But there's some minimum property repair requirements of under eleven thousand dollars, ten grand plus ten percent. That's been noted that the lender is going to need done that can be done after close of escrow. That that money is just added to the buyer's loan, held by the lender until the work has been completed, and the the contractor paid. Any unused portion of that money is used to reduce the principal balance. It's never a direct credit back to the buyer. So these two are more owner-occupant driven. They have a longer 15-day bidding period for owner-occupants, okay? These next two are more investor-driven property types. There's the UI, this is uninsurable. These properties do not qualify for 203B financing, period. Typically, they have NPR repairs exceeding $10,000 or may not meet other guidelines for FHA financing. Once a property gets to be 100 years of age or so, uh, HUD usually says, we're done. We're not going to loan on this property any longer. And uh, they will categorize the property as UI, uninsurable. This is where we'll also see our burnouts, structurally damaged properties, mold-infested properties. They usually have some serious defect that prohibits financing. The UK is similar, but HUD says, you know, if you use FHA 203K, we will hang in there. We will uh, uh, support that loan, okay? And, and we're gonna segue right into the 203K. It's a, it's a wonderful program and as local listing brokers, as I said before, we, we have a much lower fallout rate when we use these. There's typically two types. There's the traditional or stream streamlined. And you'll use, you'll select which program to use depending on your buyer needs and the amount of that, uh, that rehab. The 203K loans have a minimum requirement of $5,000 for traditional and can be used for structural repairs. The streamlines are meant for homes that don't require structural repairs and they have a maximum cap of 35,000 in repair. So these are, Streamline is more cosmetic in nature. 203K is whatever meets the maximum FHA loan requirement is really your only limitation. Both repairs, both programs require repairs to begin within 30 days and close within six months. Please make sure you have a lender who's skilled at doing these rehab loans. Any lender will tell you they can do them but believe me, there are some strategies, some techniques that will kill your deal if your lender is not familiar with it. So I encourage you to please make sure you work with a lender that is skilled and proficient at rehab loans. These are some of the items that you can do uh, with, a two, with 203K financing. I'm just gonna give you a moment to take a look. These, uh, this is an extremely uh, versatile loan program. It allows you to think outside the box when you're looking for, for properties to show. Since you can actually add square footage, you can take a one or two bedroom and turn it into a three bedroom, four bedroom, whatever. 
You can add bathrooms, bedrooms, family rooms. You can even add units if the property is zoned correctly. The only caveat there is that there must be something connecting the units together, either a wall, even an archway will satisfy HUD's requirement. So you can take a, in fact, you can even take a five or six unit building and turn it into a four unit dwelling. So you can go both ways. You can add units or you can de detract or subtract units. Uh, as long as you keep it four units and under, this method of financing will do the trick. It's a wonderful program. And since the appraisal is going to be ordered based on future value after the rehab is done, this is why we see a lot less fallout with 203k financing because the, the appraiser is much more aggressive in their values since they are looking at the top of the market rather than the mean. Please do have a pre-approval letter before submitting a bid. Uh, if it's cash, you'll need proof of cash as well. Uh, yeah, please, this goes without saying, but HUD, we have a high degree of fallout in HUD. A lot of the reason is because Agents have not gone through a training like you're going through right now. They also think that you can renegotiate these with the seller, which is kind of standard on most transactions. Um, you, you must be informed about property conditions. And as I said, David will show you where the, pro, the PCR and disclosure documents are shown under the addendums tab. Please look there prior to showing the property so you know you're matching the buyer up with the right kind of property and the financing that would be required, okay? Please make sure your buyer's pre-qualified with this information that's shown here on the screen, your buyer's name, the amount, make sure it's current and all their information and lender's information is there on the, on the letter. Another screen to remind us all of the importance of solid and qualified buyers. Um, uh, please make sure that they've seen the inspections. The PCR has been disclosed. Um, make sure that uh, you've got the, the right buyer and financing type matched up. Um, we we want to make sure that uh, you don't end up overbidding thinking that you can renegotiate during escrow. If the appraisal does not come in, your buyer is going to be given the option to come up with the difference in cash or cancel the, the transaction. If they cancel the transaction, they can always come back on and rebid, but now they're competing with all the other buyers that are also wanting to bid on the property. And as I say, this is another reason why we love the 203k financing. The, the, uh, the, the, we have a lot less problems with appraisals coming in low with 203k financing. This is another reminder of the same thing I just stated. The other thing about when another appraisal is ordered, you can't just rest on what those problems are that we're dealing with or showing in our PCRs. Your appraisal may come up with more or less items. Your buyer will need to accommodate whatever those items are. There's also a Q&A or will be a Q&A document. Um, once this information is up on a team's site, it's not there yet, but it will be soon. There'll be a Q&A document that we encourage you to get to your lender and let them review before they begin. We could help you with that right now. Okay. If you're notified of a, being a successful bidder, we're happy to help you with that right now. How are bids submitted? all through hudhomestore.com. It's really simple. It takes you about two minutes to get a contract submitted. Your broker has a NAID or should have a NAID number. All that is is name and address ID. And David will show you where that information is, how to obtain one and how you can register under your broker's NAID in his portion of the presentation. I'm gonna go Briefly through the listing periods, I'm not going to dwell really long on these because it's a lot of information and David will show you where you can see this information on the screen at hudhomestore.com. 
but just know that the exclusive listing period for the IN and IE finance types, it's for a 15 day period. The first bid review is done 10 days after listing. If we go into escrow, it's done. If it falls out of escrow, it comes back on exclusively for owner occupants for five more days on a daily basis. If it's not sold then, it rolls over to extended. Extended listings have the ability for any buyer, owner occupants or investors are able to bid. The UI bid review is shorter. As I said earlier, these are more investor driven. They have a five day exclusive listing period where they're only for owner occupants. Once it goes to the six day, they roll over to extended at which time investors and owner occupants can bid, anyone can bid. If the bid review changes or bid, the bidding, uh, the listing type changes over the weekend from exclusive to extended, you will need to submit another bid for the extended listing type, okay? And all this talks about details that will just numb your brain. David will help you, help show you where you can find this on the HUD Home Store site. As I said before, bids are accepted based on HUD guidelines, but they're looking for the highest net cash in their pocket. Purchase price is irrelevant. And we'll give you some tips in just a little bit on how you may manipulate that number to try to achieve that highest net to HUD. There is a lottery and a good neighbor next door program. Certain properties that are noted in the system have been as being in a lottery area of interest are listed in the lottery program. There are um, properties that fall into single families that fall into designated revitalization areas are also assigned to the lottery program. These are only available for good neighbor next door participants, HUD approved nonprofits and government entities. Okay, so this is a great little niche, you guys. The process is, is as follows. There, these listings are sold exclusively through HUD, HUDHomestore.com. They're not found in the MLS. All offers have to be submitted at full price, no credits. And none of us receive a commission, okay? We as local listing brokers do this as just part of the service that we offer, it's part of our job. You, however, as representing the buyer have certainly have the right to ask your buyer to pay your commission. And we encourage you to do that. Make sure they, they agree to pay you on the full price, what the full value of the property is. And they won't mind doing that because you're gonna get them such a great deal. Um, the Good Neighbor Next Door program allows officers, teachers, EMTs, or firefighters who live in the area where the property is located to submit a bid, full price, no credits, no commissions. Buyer's gonna pay your commission. And at bid deadline, HUD will pull a name from the hat and that lucky buyer or that blessed buyer, I should say, uh, has the right to close escrow at 50% off the value of the property. There are some stipulations. You've got to meet their eligibility requirements. As I said, the buyer signs a second mortgage and note for the discounted amount, which sits on the shelf. That silent second just sits on the shelf for until the three year owner occupancy period has been met. Then it disappears, it's gone for good. Another caveat is that neither the buyer nor his spouse may have owned any residential property during the year prior to the date of submitting a bid. That's crucial. Prior to submitting a bid on the home they intend to purchase. And you can never do it again. This is a once in a lifetime shot. Once you hit it, you cannot participate another time. It's a great program. Okay, how much is HUD pay toward closing costs and commissions? HUD will pay up to 3% towards buyer's closing costs on owner occupants only. And that's it. They, uh, they, the costs are gonna be a little bit higher here because the buyer is going to be, all the costs are on the buyer. Uh, so you may need to utilize that 3% offer that HUD makes. 
HUD also pays up to 6% commission. You can manipulate that number on your side downward a little bit if you want to increase your net to HUD. And we'll talk more about that strategy in just a little bit. Closing costs paid automatically by HUD, almost nothing. They'll pay for, um, they'll prorate property taxes and any special assessments, utilities, HOA fees. They'll pay for recording fees and that's about it. So the buyer has to pay the burden of all the rest of the costs. So that it will push those costs up higher than you're used to spending. Only the winning bidder is notified at this point in time. Uh, and we will help you every step of the way once you're notified that you are the winning bidder. Okay, at this point in time, I'm gonna stop my share and turn it over to Caroline to jump on and we'll get this portion of the presentation wrapped up before Davis takes it, takes you to the uh, website. Are you able to All pick right. that up? Yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Caroline Dim uh, with Expert Real Estate. Mike, can you confirm that you can see my screen? I can. Okay, now does it look the way that it's supposed to look or does it have the, the well, two windows? I, how's that? Okay, wait a sec. I think that's got two windows. That's got two windows. Hold on for one sec. How's that? Yes, one window. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Caroline Dim with Expert Real Estate. I'm also a real estate broker that sells HUD properties. Uh, as Justin and Mike have mentioned, we're right now in kind of a transitional period. But here's the cool thing. HUD doesn't change. HUD is always kind of the same way. Um, and what happens is when HUD makes a change, it's generally going to be a nationwide change and everyone is notified officially through what's called a mortgagee letter. Okay, so one example of that, as I think Mike had mentioned, uh, before HUD lists a property for sale, they will order a, an appraisal before someone goes out, uh, an FHA appraisal will be done. The appraiser goes out, they determine the value, they might identify some lender required repairs. Um, in the past, what ha happened was HUD used to give this appraisal to the buyers to use if they were using FHA financing, which was cool because then the, the buyers already knew what the value was gonna be uh, and they already knew what the lender required repairs would be, perfect. But what ended up happening was a lot of buyers, they were not able to bid above the asking price because they were kind of limited to that appraisal value. So then HUD said, well, we still need to pull the appraisal because we need to know what the value is before listing it. <clears throat> Their list price may or may not be the actual appraisal value. But what they do is um, they have the appraisal done, they still identify the repairs, and then they've got that value internally. That's great. I don't get to see it. Mike doesn't get to see it. Justin and David, none of us gets to see it, not even the buyer's agent, nobody. Your lender can't pull it up. Um, but they do do an appraisal. And then what ends up happening is if your buyer is an FHA buyer, you get to do a new appraisal, which is good because your appraiser may have a difference of opinion where they may say, you know, instead the house is worth 450, they'll say, well, I understand that this is a hot market. You know, this, this property is probably worth about 480 right now. So that kind of thing. And when HUD makes changes, they announce it through a mortgagee letter. So you can see it on your screen right now that there is a mortgagee letter 2015-17. What that means is that in the year 2015, they had at least 17 announcements that they made. This was the 17th announcement. 2021 and 2000, they actually had a lot of changes because of COVID. So they say, oh, because of COVID, um, maybe we have like a relaxed requirement for X, Y, or Z. And that was all announced through a mortgagee letter. So even though the asset manager may be changing for the state of California, HUD's rules remain the same throughout. There's no change in that. Okay, so here's a good example. HUD has a very, very strict as-is policy. Okay, so these houses are sold as-is. If there are required repairs in order to obtain financing, guess what? HUD says no. So if you are an FHA buyer, they have that financing that Mike has mentioned. You don't necessarily need to do a full-blown rehab. You don't need to get a 203K or a 203K streamline. You can just do a regular FHA loan and add up to $10,000 worth of repairs 
and it's still considered a regular FHA loan. If it's a HUD-owned property, you can do that. It's simple, but it's still going to be sold as is. No one's allowed to touch the property prior to closing. Um, and if you have a conventional buyer, and let's say, uh, let's just say, for example, if the water heater is missing, most lenders are not going to finance based on that. Well, you have to explain to your lender, we will do it as soon as we close. My buyers will sign a document saying that they are responsible, that they will, uh, that they'll repair or replace the water heater as soon as we close escrow. Maybe that lender will also have some kind of a hold back program where they overfund the loan. And then after close, they're holding on to an extra $2,000 or however much it would cost to get that water heater replaced after closing. So there are lenders that can do it. There are some lenders who cannot do it, but don't understand that. So if you tell your lender, hey, this property needs some work, we need to buy it as is, and they say, oh, yeah, no problem, no problem, they do the appraisal, and then they say, oh, great, but, you know, you just got to put the water heater in, nothing else. That nothing else is no. HUD is very strict on that, okay? So please make sure whether it's cash, conventional, VA, FHA, uh, any other type of financing you come up with, that the property can be closed and funded in its current condition. What the buyer does after they take ownership, that is a new homeowner making a decision. But nothing can be done while HUD owns that property. And that's not going to be a policy that changes in the near future as far as I know. That's not to say the buyers are not allowed to get a home inspection, though. In fact, we recommend it. We very, very highly recommend it. HUD recommends it. Um, you as a buyer's agent, you should recommend it because even if the house is sold as is, let your buyer be fully aware of what they're buying. The house may be old. It may not need, uh, you know, major mechanical repairs, though. So if it's a cosmetic thing and your buyer goes in saying, okay, well, an inspector checked it out. We're going to need to do some work. We need to get off this, you know, wallpaper. We're going to have to redo the kitchen. But at least the bones are there. Fine. But if the home inspector goes in there and they see that the plumbing is shot or um, the roof looks fine from the street level, but when he's up there, he sees some real big concerns. If the buyer goes, well, we can't afford to make these changes or to repair this property after close of escrow, that's a come to Jesus meeting or a, a decision. You've got to maybe talk to your lender and see, maybe we can change this to renovation financing. Can we maybe, instead of funding a loan for 430000 maybe get a loan for 455000 to cover all of the repairs? We've got a bid from a contractor. It's about $25,000. Can we overfund on this and then take that $25,000 overfund and make the repairs, pay the contractor after closing to do all of this stuff? And then at least the buyer is going to be paying for that $25,000 over the course of their loan, rather than paying it out of pocket up front. Without a home inspection, though, you will never know that kind of stuff. Okay, so there's a lot of creative work around. Please advise your buyer to get home inspections. They have 15 days from the date of fully executed contract. That's after the buyer signs and after the seller signs. They have 15 days to get their home inspection done. The utilities are generally going to be shut off in a HUD-owned property. That's HUD's nationwide policy. There are parts of the country where pipes will freeze, so they say to everybody, shut off the water. There are uh, some places where, you know, it may not be safe to have gas on in a vacant property. Maybe there's the potential for gas leaks or, or what have you. There's really no good that comes out of having gas on in a vacant home anyway. Same goes for electricity. If your buyer needs to get utilities turned on for their inspections and very likely for their appraisal, that's going to be the responsibility of the buyer and their agent, which is going to be you, to turn on the utilities in the buyer's name for just a very, very short period of time. Okay, so uh, if that means we get them turned on on Tuesday, and HUD's already said we've got to keep them on for no more than three days, so we have to turn them off by Friday. Make sure you schedule your inspections and your appraisals all in that window of time between Tuesday and Friday. Then get those utilities shut off. If there's any damage that comes because the utilities are kept on, maybe the buyer goes, well, that's stupid. I'm going to close this in about 30 days, and I'm going to have to call them again and have them come out again. Yes. Yes, you are. Because if there's any damage that gets done, that's going to be the buyer's responsibility 
because they are the ones that were not following the rules. The rules are get them turned on just long enough to do your inspections and your appraisal, then get them shut off. But please, again, do your home inspection because these homes are sold as is. Obviously, if your buyers don't own the property, they have no right to go in there and do any uh, repairs or improvements, even if they think they're adding to the house or they're adding value. Um, we did hear once of somebody who went in and they, they refloored the entire house during escrow. They didn't own the property. They came this close to losing that property because HUD is within their rights to cancel the contract. And if that's the case, the buyer cannot go in and start taking the new floors out. Because if they do that, once something is affixed to the property, we know this, it becomes a part of the property. So if they put in new floors and they go in to take out what they consider to be their floors, those floors are actually now a free gift to HUD. And if you are taking those floors out, you are stealing government property. So the, uh, the jail time, the legal fees, all of that, it's not worth it. Tell your buyer, do everything after we close. Don't even advise them if we're funded on Friday, planning to record on Monday. Do not advise them, oh, it's no big deal if you go buy a bunch of stuff from Home Depot so your work crews can start on Monday morning and leave it in the garage. Leave it in their garage or go to Home Depot at 6 a.m. and meet the crew there at 8 a.m. But do not do anything to um, try to take over that property, to occupy it, store possessions on there. Don't change the locks. It's all pretty common sense stuff, but don't do any of that prior to close of escrow, please. Okay, so uh, a HUD contract is generally gonna be for 30 days, 45 days, or 60 days. And it depends on the buyer's height and it depends on the buyer's financing. So it's gonna be dictated uh, ahead of time. Your buyer doesn't get to say, oh yeah, if your buyer wants to close early, hey, I'm a cash buyer, we want to close in 10 days. If you can get it done, no problem. But the contract period will still be 30 days. And if you have a, a non-owner occupant buyer, an investor buyer, and they're getting conventional financing, their contract will also be for 30 days, okay? So even if they might need 45 days to get their loan done, their contract period is technically 15 days. Uh, if your buyer needs an extension though, there is an extension request form that you're gonna find on the asset manager's website. Whoever the asset manager is, they should have it on their website. Hey, we need to extend this closing out an extra 15 days. And you always do it in a 15 day package. In those 15 day increments, you will, uh, you'll pay an extension fee. And the per diem depends on the fee that is given to you. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the the time that you're given, and it's based on the purchase price. So if the purchase price in our market is almost always going to be more than $50,000, right? So the extension fee is $25 per day, and we have to do it in a 15-day increment. So you're going to pay an extension fee of $375 in advance, and then whatever part of it is not used up, no problem. They can just, uh, you know, they can just get that money refunded to them and prorated. If they only use one day, then the remainder is going to be prorated back and refunded at closing. Okay. Um, giving your buyer a key at closing, don't do it. Don't do it. Mike mentioned this. These are master locked keys or master rekey properties. So that key may not work at every other HUD property, but it might work at another one. Okay. Just as that key from another property could open this property. Not only that, who has the keys? HUD vendors all have the keys. So for your buyer's security, please do not give them a key at closing. Rather, meet them at the property on the day of closing, and a nice closing gift might be nice door lock from you know, a hardware store so that they can change it themselves. Or you hire a locksmith to meet you at the property and rekey immediately to show your client how serious you take their security and their safety. If they're moving things back and forth over the weekend and the field services company has not been notified of the change, they might be doing a routine inspection and they go to a HUD house, they use their master key. Lockbox is gone. They use their master key. They go inside and they go, oh, we've got a squatter. 
and they start throwing everything out and your buyer comes back and their house is empty, they're going to be like, what happened? And they might get mad at you and you might try to get mad at us, but we are telling you now, tell your buyer to rekey immediately. Don't give them the temptation of, oh, well, a locksmith charges more on a Saturday, so we'll do it on Monday. A lot of things can happen between Saturday and Monday. Pay the extra money to have an emergency rekey if that's what it needs to be. Or go to Home Depot and get some nice door locks. Quite honestly, most of these doorknobs are either pretty old or they've been changed out for those really, really cheap ones that you see at a lot of REO properties. And I'm not going to tell you how, but I can tell you I can open them. So they're not super secure. Put in something nice that looks good with the house and that's going to be like, you know, like a schlage or something like really hard to just get opened by anybody. Uh, welcome to the 21st century. Now e-signatures are available on HUD contracts. That makes everybody's life a lot easier. Okay, so this I'm going to kind of speed through because it only matters once your offer is accepted. And as Mike had probably mentioned, when uh, you're submitting an offer online, you're actually submitting the offer through HUD's website. Okay, so HUD's website will be HUDHomeStore.com or a hub, yeah, hubhomestore.com. David Jervis will show you that website directly during his part of the presentation, but you submit the offer at Hud Home Store. Once the offer is accepted, then everything kind of passes through the asset management company, which right now is, you know, uh, it's just recently changed. So we're waiting on some, some guidance from them as to what just website we'll send you to. But on their website, it'll have all of the forms that we need, including the sales contract, which will also come from HUD Home Store if you need, um, but all the addendums like the extensions, the, um, adding a buyer, removing a buyer, all of those addendums will be found on the asset manager's website. The e-signatures though, here's the thing, when you are submitting your client's offer online, there's gonna be a field that asks your buyer's name, obviously, their social security number, their address, their email address, and their phone number. Please be sure to check and double check the buyer's name, how they spell it, how they plan to take title, because that's how the grant deed is going to be prepared. Make sure the social security number is correct because HUD does a cross-reference to make sure that the same person is not buying multiple properties acting as an owner occupant at the same time. Um, they need to see that. And then make sure that you've got their email address and their phone number correct and that it's for them. And it's not because anyone plans on going around you and contacting your client directly. It's because when they set up the contract for e-signature, it has to go directly to your buyer. It cannot go to you and then you forward it to someone else. The digital signature will get screwed up that way. So please put in the correct information for your buyer, their uh, email address and their phone number, uh, just in case anything comes up, okay? So please, please be sure to do that. So when you do have your offer accepted, you will be notified through HUD Home Store. Okay. So also when you log in to submit the offer, please make sure you log in correctly. Uh, it is very common that an agent doesn't understand the process. And then when they go to submit the offer, they think they're putting in their information when really they're putting in their broker's information. And the notification then only goes to the broker, doesn't go to the agent. The system doesn't know. So make sure that when you're submitting, it's your name and your email address that's at the bottom for confirmation, okay? When you are notified though, you're then gonna get a checklist screen like you see on your screen right now. To verify the bid, make sure all of the details are correct. They give you another chance to go in and correct things if needed. Um, verify everything and then from there, everything is gonna get populated for that, uh, the contract and the digital signature. Okay, so closing agents. On a HUD transaction, what's very unique is that the buyer gets to select the title company and the escrow company, okay? So those are the closing agents. The buyer selects the closing agents for, uh, for HUD transactions, which is great 
And this actually came out of a bad experience years ago with one of their contractors that had the contract to do all the closing. It turned into a mess and then had like, you know what? We don't care who does it as long as it's done professionally and by someone who knows how to follow our rules. So the buyer gets to pick now. The downside is now the buyer is responsible to pay all of the escrow fees and all of the title fees. So if your buyer is okay with that, that's fine. I mean, and they get to pick the service provider, which you will probably be advising them on. And that's good because you know the closing agents in your market and you know the ones that are going to answer your phone calls and help you out when you need something. So if your closing agents have already been approved by HUD, they should have what's called a title ID number. Okay, a title ID number. If they have that, simple. If not, you may need to help them get approved as a closing agent. And I hate to say this, but there are a lot of closing agents that are already approved by HUD. If you really love, love, love your closing agent and want to help them get approved, fine. But do you want to be the test case for them? And also keep in mind if there are any brokers out there, oh, well, we've got an in-house escrow. HUD does not allow for in-house broker-owned escrows. You have to be a, a third-party escrow. Um, I think if you're through the Department of Corporations, you should be okay. But if it's an in-house escrow and you're using your ML or your uh, DRE license number for the licensing, then that's generally a no-go. Okay, and that's going to be a HUD rule. Okay, earnest money deposits. So earnest money deposits on HUD are a little bit different than what we are used to. There's really only going to be three acceptable amounts to HUD. It's going to be $500, $1,000, or $2,000, and it depends on the purchase price. In our market, I mean, as HUD goes, we are one of the high price markets no matter what. So our transactions are generally going to have a $2,000 earnest money deposit. Simple enough. So $2,000, just remember that. Now, you're going to have two business days to get an original earnest money deposit over to the listing broker, because our job as the listing broker for HUD is we receive that, we verify it, we keep it in our file, and then we upload it to let everybody know we have this in our possession and it is correctly prepared. Okay, so two business days to get that to us. There are only going to be two forms that are approved and acceptable by HUD. So the earnest money deposit has to be a cashier's check. That's where you go to the bank and it says cashier's check on the face of the check or a postal money order. So it's the money order where you go to the post office. If you're going to get financing for your buyer, just be aware that if you get a postal money order, they will ask you questions. Where did you get the money? Can you show us the source? Can you show us that you don't owe that $1,000 to anyone else? In my opinion, if your buyer has a bank account, just go to the bank and get a cashier's check far fewer questions, okay? Um, and then, so two forms that are acceptable, and then on the payee line, make it payable to the closing company that your buyer has selected. So if they want to use, you know, express escrow, fine, make it out to express escrow. But somewhere in the memo line, I'm going to show you a copy, somewhere in the memo line, please put the FHA case number, put the property address, put something as an identifier in case that check falls out of a file somewhere, we will know exactly where it goes. You can also put your buyer's name on it. Um, in the past, we used to have the buyer put it like also on the payee line. We found we don't need that anymore. So if the, cancel, if the transaction is canceled, we can turn that around and give it back to the buyer, and they should be able to go back to whatever bank they went to to get that cashier's check and deposit it back in. They don't need to have their name on the payee line. Just the closing agent should be fine, but somewhere on there should have enough information that we can tie it back to your buyer in case it goes missing um, and we have to return it, then we know exactly who to give it to. Proof of funds, gosh, we are all professionals on this presentation, so I'm only going to assume that you are smart enough to verify that your buyer has got proof of funds before showing a property and certainly before submitting an offer, okay? Um, HUD does want to get a copy of the proof of funds as well, and then the buyer will need to call their lender or maybe you call the lender on behalf of your buyer to get an updated pre-approval letter um, just to make sure once their offer is accepted that you know it's got the correct address, it's got the correct buyer's names on there, the correct loan amounts, all of that stuff. And then please make sure that it's on lender letterhead so that the phone number and email address for your lender appears 
in case anyone needs to call them to follow up on the transaction and we're not able to get in touch with you, then we can call the lender directly. Okay, if your buyer is an investor, that's no problem. Investors are allowed to buy HUD property. Just remember they have to wait until it's in the extended bidding period because the exclusive bidding period is only for owner occupants. That's what HUD wants is own, only owner occupants. But if your buyer is gonna be purchasing as an LLC or a corporation or a trust, make sure that you're including with your contract package, the documentation to show that whoever signs the contract and it's a person that signs the contract, not a corporation. So if um, you know James Davis is the CEO of I Buy Properties Inc. Well, James Davis is the one that's signing everything. Show us the articles of incorporation for I Buy Properties Inc. to show that James Davis is an authorized signer for that corporation. Um, you may be asked to include some CAR forms. For the most part on this last contract, the asset manager did not want to see anything except they did want an agency disclosure signed by the buyer and signed by the agent, just to make sure that the buyer is aware who is their agent and who's uh, responsible for seeing out for the buyer's best interest. Okay, carbon monoxide detectors, smoke detectors, water heater strapping, um, all of that stuff, HUD absolutely recognizes is a requirement at point of sale in California. However, HUD is still going to be selling these properties as is. So the disclosure that HUD has the buyer sign is an acknowledgement. These things are required at points of sale. I acknowledge that and I understand it. However, I am buying a HUD-owned property and HUD is not going to do it. I acknowledge that. I accept it. I will be responsible for complying with all of these point of sale requirements as soon as we close escrow and before I, I move in. That is what they are signing. It's a disclosure and acknowledgement, what have you, where the buyer is assuming full responsibility to meet that compliance requirement. HUD does not get out of it, but that also does not mean that HUD has to make the repairs themselves. Um, oh, when you are getting the contract package signed by your client, please to have them provide you a copy of their social security card and or driver's license. You don't need to turn it into HUD, but it will also ensure that when you're submitting the offer on behalf of them or when you're doing the contract package verifying their bid, that you've got everything spelled correctly. Um, you know, you might see your buyer's name is Jonathan um, and you've been calling him Billy. And you look at his license, you're like, Billy, how come your license says Jonathan on here? He's like, oh yeah, well, Jonathan's my legal name, but I've been going by Billy since I was a kid. Okay, well, there's the question you have to ask him. How is your name going to appear on the grant deeds of the property, Billy or Jonathan? Make up, you know, make up your mind. So that is when you kind of know those questions to ask. So I would even keep a copy of it in your um, in your file, but you don't need to give it up to HUD. Just just have it and be aware of it. And the social security number, mostly because you want to make sure you didn't type it in incorrectly. That can be kind of a nightmare when you have transposed like two seven becomes seven two or something like that. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, all of the contracts or all of the properties have their utilities shut off as a rule. When we go under contract and only after we have a fully executed contract, the buyer should call the utility companies to turn on utilities in their name. When they do that, they're going to have to ask um, the field service manager, not the asset manager, but the field services company is in charge of all the physical aspects of the property. You need to ask them for a request form to turn on utilities in the buyer's name. And they will give you this, and that's how you can call the utility companies to turn on services. Now, some utility companies don't care. They should, but they don't. They're like, oh, okay, you want the electricity on? Boom, it's on Tuesday. But we also know that some companies are a little bit stricter, like the water company very commonly will say, well, we can't just turn on the water for anyone. Who's the owner of record? Oh, it's HUD. Okay, well, someone from HUD needs to call. HUD's not gonna call for you. Like, oh, but we have a, uh, an approval form or an authorization form to turn on the utilities in the buyer's name. Great, send it over. And that's when you'll be able to send it over. Meanwhile, please, if they say, by the way, there's an outstanding balance, 
get a copy of that invoice or let us know so that we can call and ask for a copy of their ledger to find out how much is owed. Um, if we close and then the buyer goes to turn on water and they never turned on water before, and the water company says, well, we're not going to turn it on until you pay this $500 past due bill, buyer's going to flip out, of course. But all of that has to be figured out before closing because once HUD closes that file, they can't open it back up and make these payments. It's done. And it's going to be too bad, so sad. Now it's the responsibility of the owner of the property. So get the utilities turned on, use the request form, keep the utilities on just for long enough to get your inspections and your appraisal done, then shut them off. If you find that there are any past due balances that will travel with the property, let us know and we'll get into it. Here's the best thing about HUD Home. Okay, and I don't think this is going to change also uh, with the asset manager because this was the same for this asset manager and the ones before. Advertising HUD properties. I mean, right now, even HUD, we're just so low on inventory. But in general, inventory is so low. And you want to talk to potential buyers. Or you want to talk to potential sellers, but you don't really have much to say. Do you know that you are allowed to advertise HUD homes and you do not need to ask the individual local listing broker permission? You don't need to call up Caroline. Hey, Caroline, I happen to farm that area. I see you've got a HUD listing. Can I market it? Nope. You can call me as a courtesy, but you don't have to. Um, go ahead and advertise it. As long as you know some, some really simple rules, okay? Number one is always keep it positive. HUD does not want to be referred to or thought of as a, uh, uh, as a like, not slumlord, what is it? Like, just owning a bunch of crummy property. You know, HUD wants to have a, a really good, positive spin on everything. Your neighbors, they don't want to be known as like living next to some crummy property. So keep everything professional, ethical, and positive in all of your advertising, okay? When you're referring to these, you can say HUD homes, HUD owned, HUD acquired. I mean, you can leave it out if you want. You can just say for sale. But please keep in mind, this is not a bank owned. HUD is not a bank. Um, HUD does not like the word foreclosure or REO. They don't like those connotations that go along with those properties. So please don't use them. That's a HUD request. And that is something that passes with every asset manager. Make sure that all of your advertising includes that equal housing opportunity logo. That's the house with the equal sign in there. You can Google it. It will come up a thousand times. But use it on all of your signage, your websites, your flyers, and all, any, any type of advertising you do, make sure. And, you know, it's good practice for us anyway. Uh, advertising guidelines, if you know of anything that is worth disclosing, please disclose it, okay? So um, if you know that it's in a flood zone or it's disclosed on the HUD website as being in a flood zone or it has an HOA, go ahead and disclose it because if that's going to make the deal fall apart and your buyer is not able to continue, I don't know about you, but I would rather waste less time and energy and excitement on a transaction that's going to fall apart anyway. So I would rather have it fall out in week one rather than week six. They call around and they call you and say, oh, you know what? I can't get any insurance on the property. It's in a flood zone and I've been calling a thousand insurance companies and no one will do it. Okay. Well, if that's the case, wouldn't you have rather they do that in week one before they pay for their inspections, before they pay for their appraisal, before, you know, you've already made plans to go out of town with this commission check that's coming in, what have you? Yes. Um, always adhere to the rules. Okay. So HUD has a set of rules that we are giving you on this presentation. You must do this. However, there might be something that is unique to your state, to your county, to your city, to your local real estate board in terms of regulations and truth and lending. If that's the case, always accept the harshest rule and abide by it, okay? Please do not think, oh, because I'm working on a HUD transaction, I get to do whatever I want. If your community says, we do not allow, um, we do not allow bandit signs. You know those signs on the side of the freeway that are stapled to the telephone pole that they like, I buy houses. So if you have one that says, you know, it's advertising a HUD property and you're like, HUD home for sale, call, call Megan. And you put it on that telephone pole. If you get in trouble, that's on you. If your city says, we don't like those, don't do it. I mean, even for us, HUD says, 
Caroline, you are absolutely required to go out and do, um, you got to put a sign in the front yard. That's minimum. For any of our agents, absolute minimum is you must put a sign in the yard. If I go into a community and it's a homeowners association that says, you cannot put a sign in the yard. I am not going to go and put a sign in the yard and act like a jerk. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, great, can I find that in writing somewhere on your, on your community website? I will make a, you know, print the screen for that. I will send it to the asset manager and I'll say, hey, I understand that HUD requires us to put a sign in the yard. I cannot in the community and this is why. They'll be fine with it. Now, they won't, get, they won't be happy if I don't say anything, you know, because then they'll just be like, oh, agent's not doing her job. But if they know that I, un not, I understand the job, but I'm not going to follow their rule because there's a stricter rule out there, they're fine with that, okay? When you're showing a HUD property, by the way, everything's on Supra, okay? So uh, before, I think, June 15th, we all had to use PED forms for entry. I don't think those PED forms are required anymore. But when we had a Supra there, we always had those CDS codes in, uh, enacted so that you couldn't get in. You, you, you see a sign or you see a lockbox in a front door, number one, you shouldn't just be going up to it anyway. But number two, maybe you're able to check them phone. oh, okay, it's available. And you were not able to just go up and, and open it. Nowadays, the CBS codes for the most part might be gone. Check the agent showing remarks before you go, but um, the key should all be in a Supra. You should be able to access it, you know, during reasonable hours. Keep in mind, utilities are off, so summertime at least we've got long days, but don't go in the dark. Um, the key should be in a Supra. Put the key back. That's how everyone is showing the property. So if you happen to take the key, guess what? Next guy can't show the property, and that's not fair. Okay? If you go to a house and, and there's an issue or something is damaged or needs to be addressed, please let us know. Um, you know, we will definitely run out there right away and take care of it. There are some things that are on the no-no list, okay? So the no-no list is if you happen to find out that a HUD property is coming down the line, but you don't have any of the details because it's not listed for sale on the HUD home store website, don't advertise it, okay? Don't advertise it for sale if it's not available to the general public. So for example, good neighbor next door. When your buyer might be eligible to get a property for 50% off, but it's only eligible if you're a firefighter, police officer, EMT, or teacher, and they are working and living in the same community. Don't put that property out on Craigslist for 50% off because not all the buyers will be eligible. And even the eligible buyers may not be eligible for that particular house because they don't work and live in the same community. Okay? So that's a no-no. Um, don't ever use the FHA seal or logo or anything that's going to misconstrue who you are. If the general public is confused, and thinks that you work for HUD, or if the general public is confused and thinks that they can only buy HUD property through you, that is going to be a huge red flag. If there's ever a complaint about you, they will come after you and they will come down hard. HUD really cares about protecting the community. They really care about protecting owner occupants and the innocent general consumer. Okay, so please don't do anything. There's plenty of business to be had keeping it clean. Keep it clean. Do not give out the HUD keys. Please <laughs> do not give out the HUD keys. This is like our worst nightmare. Um, but I don't think so many agents do it these days. It used to be like, it seemed like everybody had a set of what they thought were the HUD keys. So then HUD started changing their key codes every six months. I can't keep my head straight as to what the codes are for this six month period. But every six months we would get an email and say, these are the new HUD key codes. Don't give them out. Just, you know, have the house rekeyed and put the keys back in the box. I already mentioned this, but don't refer to anything in the advertising for HUD homes as, you know, distressed, foreclosed, um, repo, must sell, anything like that, HUD doesn't like it. Uh, in terms of signage, only one party is allowed to put signage in and around the property, and that's gonna be the local listing broker that is hired through the asset management company. Um, you're not allowed to do it. Uh, open houses also are restricted only to the listing broker of record, and, and that's generally because there are some issues with HUD properties that most agents don't think about. The utilities are off. There's no toilet. So doing a five-hour open house is not a good idea in a house with no working toilet, okay? Um, there are other things, and, you know, 
keeping the house secure and, and all of that. We just want to make sure that these houses are preserved and maintained. Uh, if you want to show the house 100 times in a five-hour span, go for it. We're not going to stop you. But uh, if the question is, hey, Caroline, can I hold an open house? Unfortunately, the answer is no. You know, HUD has a rule about that. Don't damage or destroy anyone else's stuff on there. So if someone else is not breaking, if someone else is breaking a rule, that's great. You're not the police. You're not HUD. You are not quality control for HUD. Just take a photo, let the local listing broker know, and then, you know, we'll take care of it. So if you see that you go up there and like some, some other agent sign happens to be in the front yard, or um, there's like a, a, a second sign like in the front yard, like it says, you know, I also sell repo homes or something, you know, call so-and-so. Let us know, and then we will take the time to remove it, and then we'll file an incident report. In terms of advertising, because HUD allows you to advertise these homes, this might be a great time for you to really hone in and work on your skills, okay? And you can practice on a HUD property because no harm, no foul. You're not going to be fired by your seller because it's not really your seller. Um, but please, don't get reported to HUD. That's a bad thing, too. But you can advertise anywhere you would normally advertise. Newspapers, magazines, flyers, um, billboards. If you have seminars for first-time buyers, you can explain to them, like, the benefits of buying a HUD property. Social media, I'm sure you've got a Facebook page, Insta, Twitter. Uh, there's another one, something like posting something. It's the dream board one. I can't think of the name of it. Um, you know, anything on the internet, if you want to do like just listed, just sold postcards, go for it. Message boards, I don't know the last time I've seen a message board. It must have been 1997, but okay. Uh, email list, if you've got like a, a, a distribution list for your buyers and your investors, go for it. Craigslist, TV, radio. Really, I mean, there are so many avenues to advertise right now, and a lot of them are free. A lot of them are freemium. You pay a little bit more, but you get a really cool enhanced product. Um, use that. And then when you're going in for other presentations, so you can use these as examples. Like, yeah, if I can make this house look great, imagine what I can do for yours, you know? Or you get one really good video out there um, and distribute it to your followers. There's only one buyer for that one home, but you might pick up five or six or seven great buyers that you can then take to other properties. So, um, right now, I don't know if David is quite ready, but I see that we've got some questions on the chat. So, David, if you want to jump in on audio and let me know you're ready, cool. Otherwise, I'm going to go through and see if there are any questions that I can answer. Okay. I'm ready to go. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Well, that's remarkable. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to stop the share chair. screen. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, can everybody see the HUD home store, US HUD.gov forward slash HUD homes on the screen? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Hi, I'm David Jervis. I'm with Caldwell Banker and I've been doing HUD for a few years like Mike and Caroline and Justin. I'm gonna uh, go quickly through this. And then at the end, if we have any questions on it, we can go back and take a look at it. What you're looking at right now is the official site. It's, uh, easiest way to get there is www dot hudhomestore.com you'll see that up in the corner on the toolbar on the uh, address bar make sure when you type it in that you do type hudhomestore.com there are several lookalikes that look i mean they are lookalikes they look just like this site but they're not they're uh, hud houses hud sales things like that and basically those are just scraping data and selling it back to real estate agents and lenders so if we take a look at the hud site right now this is where you'll find it at everything that takes place on a hud transaction prior to contract takes place here. Um, when we take a look at it, we'll start from the very top. Right now, you can skip this app for the iPhone. It doesn't work. I don't know if the Android system is an upgraded or if they have problems, but right now the Android app does not work with the latest version of the iOS operating system, okay? If you are going to be registering to become a HUD selling broker, not a HUD listing broker, but a HUD selling broker, you're gonna start up in this corner, register as a bidder. We'll come back to that in just a moment. These are a couple different search screens that they have on the HUD site. Good neighbor next door, nonprofits, dollar homes. We don't have any of those in California. 
if you look at the map on the right and take a look at the legend down below, you'll see the dark blue states are the only states right now that have HUD inventory in the United States. Uh, very, very low. I don't know if this is because of the switchover in management companies or what they're doing, but it is um, <clears throat> very, very few states that have inventory. You can click on the state and that'll give you a link of what we have in California. You'll see we only have three properties in all of California right now, one in Riverside, two in San Bernardino. So if I go back, you can also search down here on the toolbar, select the state and search, and you're gonna get the same result. Okay. One of the big mistakes that people tend to make, especially consumers, not so much agents, but more consumers, is they can go to this website also. They'll click here, good neighbor next door, and then they'll go down and they'll do a search. And they'll assume that everything that popped up is a good neighbor next door. Okay, that's not the case. Uh, what happens is when you go back to the page and you click on good neighbor next door, let's go back one more. Okay, if you'll notice here, good neighbor next door, everything went light blue. It looks like there's only one state right now that has a good neighbor next door property or two of them. Both of these are in the lottery, good neighbor next door, good neighbor next door. So only in Virginia right now do you have good neighbor next door properties, nowhere else in the United States. So that makes it a little bit easy to search that way. Okay, let's go ahead and start the login process right now. If you're gonna register, you're gonna need your NAID number. That's name and address ID. That's a number that HUD has issued to your broker. It's not his broker's license number. It is something when they first started the brokerage, um, or at some point they applied for from HUD and received. Once you have that, you can go up here to the bidder tab. And you'll see your create your bidder registration. What you're gonna be doing is registering yourself as a selling listing broker and what your role is. If you're an agent, click as an agent. You'll put your NAID number in here once you find it. I'll go ahead and put mine in for the moment. Okay, put your own license number. State licensed, and then your expiration. And once you get here to add, you'll see in my case, because we have, I, I work for corporate, corporate Caldwell Banker, all of these offices are under our NAID number. So if you work for a multi-office franchise like I do, make sure that you pick the right office that you do work for and select it in the, um, in the link. So let's see what we've got here. Okay, so automatically now my information, 840 Newport Center Drive Suite 100 would pop up on this. At that time, I'd go down and create my own username, my own password and confirm it, and then create my own security questions as well as my contact information. Um, I can't tell you how important this is. What happens is a lot of times people would register or go present or submit an offer on a HUD property using their manager's login. That's fine if there's just a few of you in the office, um, you could do that. However, if you're in a multiple office franchise like I am and you submit an offer and we get the confirmation that you've accepted, your bid's been accepted, and we call the office and ask for Joe Manager, he is not gonna know which one of 5,000 agents submitted that offer. 72 hours go by, we don't know who got the property, who the, what broker sold it, what agent in the office sold it. It gets canceled and goes back on the market. So you don't wanna lose that. So this is a very simple process to do. Now, once you've done this, you're gonna be in the system and you can also go back and change and modify that once you have a login and an ID. Uh, let me share another screen with you real quick. We can do it, see an idea what that looks like. Okay, do you see the HUD screen again now on this side? Yes, sir. Okay, you'll see that I'm logged in up here. It says, welcome David Jervis. So if you have already been in the HUD system and maybe you change brokerages, one thing you can do is go up here to bidder functions, manage your profile. If you need to change companies, you can also do it right here. If you wanna change your security questions, if you wanna update your real estate license, et cetera, 
you can do that at this location. So let's say that you just move from one company to Caldwell Banker to Keller Williams, wherever you go, you've got a new NAID number. All you're gonna do is put that new NAID number in here and then modify, and it's gonna show you as being transferred over to the new company. So it's a very, very simple process. Or if your contact information changes, you get a new cell phone number, you get a new email, things like that. You do that under bidder functions. We'll go home now. Now, if your broker, one thing that you do you make be aware of is that the NAID number is updated on an annual basis. In the past, HUD did a poor job of policing the database. You could submit offers with an expired NAID. Uh, that doesn't work anymore. You can't register with an expired NAID. If your broker has a NAID number that has not been updated, they can go here, click on this link, and that will take them to the recertification window where they can do whatever it is they need to do. If you want to find what your NAID is, you can also do that here on this one. <clears throat> find NAID application type. If it's an individual or a business, you can click and plug in the social security or the tax ID number, and that will tell you what your NAID number is and whether or not it is active at the moment. If it does need to be recertified and there's been no changes in the brokerage, it's a very simple process. It takes about 20 minutes online. Once that's done, then you can submit offers and you can also register, do anything that you need to do. Okay, so let's go home again real quick. All right, you'll see we're back on the home screen again. We've already talked about this. We know there's no nonprofits. We know there's no dollar homes in California. And this is where we typically do our searching at the bottom. And so let's take a look again at the state. We'll search all three properties and we'll cover real quickly. If you'll notice back in Mike's part of the presentation, we talked about the listing statuses. You'll see two of them here, exclusive. And when you roll your mouse over, it says owner occupants, nonprofits and government agencies only. So extended, anybody can bid on this property, all bidders. So we have two that are exclusive and one that's extended. The key things to look at on this particular section of the page are what is the bid opening date? 726, 721. So if we take a look at this, we know it's extended and the next bid opening is on 721. What that means is it's on a nightly bid, Monday through Friday, and no one had submitted a successful bid on this yet. No one submitted an offer that's high enough in net to HUD for them to accept it. So it says here the next bid opening date is 721, which is tomorrow morning. So tomorrow morning, usually by 10 or 11 o'clock um, our time, HUD will have picked a bid. This will no longer appear on the screen and the selling agent will have been notified that they were an accepted bidder on the property. So always keep track of what that bid date is. And then when you go into the site itself, you can take a look at a little bit more information. You can look at what the period deadline is. So we know this was listed on the 14th. It's listed exclusively. This exclusive listing ends on 728. So when they have the first bid opening on this property, if no one bids a winning bid on it, that's an owner occupant, the next time it comes back up the following day, this is gonna be an extended property. So the one thing I like about extended listings is sometimes on those, you have a little bit better chance of getting a, a better price on the property than you do on an exclusive listing. When it first comes on the market, our experience has been that HUD typically does not come off that price very quickly. They may allow for list price, plus maybe one or 2%, which would be the typical closing cost that a buyer may ask for. Again, that's not a hard and fast rule, just something we've experienced over several years of doing this product. Now that we're on the page, we'll take a look at some of the information. We have the address. This is in Riverside County or Banning. Gives you the bedrooms, the baths, the total room, the square footage, when it was built, what type of property it is. It gives you a fair amount of pictures to look at. So your client can get an idea of what the property looks like. This one is not in bad shape compared to a lot of them that we've had over the years. So it looks like it needs you know, a little bit of work and that's probably why it's considered an, uh, an IE property. Is this financing? Yes, this is insured, meaning that this one does not require anything to be FHA financeable. So they're saying this one, we don't need smoke detectors. We don't need anything. It's ready to go. You can use 203K. It tells you what the list price is. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, it tells you when the bid change is going to occur on the 28th. Addendums, uh, the new asset management company does not put a lot of addendums in there. These are the things that you want to look at, though, the property disclosure and the condition report. So if we click on this link right now, 
we're going to get a PDF pop up and I'll share that with you in just a moment. Can everybody see the property disclosure and repair information sheet? Yes. Okay. This is all the information that HUD has on the property when they put it out to market. And these are a little bit new for us. They look a little different than the ones that we previously worked with, but here's the information that they had. Tells us the address, NPR property repairs. On this property, there were none noted. Uh, again, they put the disclosure that even though the, the smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors are required, HUD is not gonna do it. Tells you you need a home inspection. Um, and it talks again about the utilities that you have to contact the field service company to turn those on and the fee may be involved in doing it. And it also goes back and tells you about the termite disclosure for FHA financing only that they will do an inspection and treatment only on the termite. Again, they also do the lead based paint if the property was built before 1976 on an FHA transaction. So that's one thing you get on this. We'll go back here, start for square, next share. Okay, the other one I want to take a look at is called the property condition report. This is not a home inspection. This is the report that HUD gets from the field service company once they've acquired the property. It tells them was the uh, Utilities were all on, so they passed everything on this one. If they found the utilities were off, they would have said that, you know, we could not, we tested it with either air pressure or with electric generator. Typically what HUD does, if there are no utilities for the water, they plug the compressor into the uh, hose bib, turn it on. If it holds pressure, they consider the, the plumbing to be good. On the electricity, if the electricity is off, they plug a generator into the service panel. And if everything turns to work, then they consider it to be good. They take a look at the roof and see if it you know, looks like it looks good. They say, yes, that's good. They don't see any stains in the ceiling. So it's just a quick down and dirty inspection that they get from their field service company. But on HUD properties, you do not, you do not want to use this as your home inspection. You want to make sure that you have a complete home inspection done during your due diligence timeline. Okay, let's go back to the... Okay, we're back to the HUD home store screen again. We'll go back and let's do a, a different search real quick. Okay, let's take a look at one that's extended really quickly and see if it has anything different on here. Okay, this one good. This was an IE, an insured escrow property, meaning there are minimum property requirements that have not been met per the appraisal on this property. So if we go back to the amenities tab or to the addendums tab again, we can take a look and see what it is. Here we go, minimum property requirements. Sliders in the rear of the house have a three foot drop and tall stall two sets of stairs with handrails or a full wood deck. They're saying the water heater is tankless. Um, in this case, we don't know what that means is that most people with a tankless water heater be happy. It doesn't seem that HUD is, so it's not gonna be strapped and it does need carbon monoxide detectors. Okay, and again, they put down the property disclosures. This is insurable with repair escrow, less than $10,000 in estimated NPR repairs. One thing to remember on the NPR repairs is that if your appraiser goes out and he does not tag these items and you can get a copy of that clear appraisal, you can send this in to your closer and they will remove the MPR requirement off of this and allow you to get a regular FHA loan. On the other hand, if your appraiser comes out and they do find more repairs than what's showing on here, those will have to be added to the MPR and will still need to stay under $10,000. If it goes over 10,000, they're gonna be asked to either change the financing type to FHA 203K or cancel the escrow. Um, this is also important to know if there's gonna be a lead-based paint inspection. If the lead-based paint repairs are over $4,000, even $4,001, they will not allow you to use a 203, um, an IE program. You'll have to switch it to 203K. What will happen is that your buyer will get the $4,000 credit through escrow and the lead-based paint repairs will have to be done through the 203K process. So let's switch this back.
Okay, back to the screen. Anytime you want to know the agent information, you can click on this tab. It'll tell you who the listing agent is on the property, give you their phone number and their email address. This, of course, is the asset management company, um, A-Team Realty. Those are the ones that employ us. So one thing too, to uh, piggyback on what Caroline had just said before she signed off, on these properties on the HUD home store site, should you want to market it and you want something really quickly, HUD makes it pretty easy for you to do that. Go to the screen here, click on the print property flyer, and instantly you have a flyer with plenty of room for your business card. Print one copy, slap your card on it, run it down to Kinko's and make 100 copies and go knock on doors. Um, I like it doing it this way only because it makes it look me very, makes me look very official. And what I found is that people are always very anxious to talk to you about government homes because they perceive this to be a tremendous value. Now we know that these are really just homes that are sold retail through the bidding process, but talking to the public in large, they have watched TV shows. They're always looking for something that looks like it's going to be a deal. So this will get the door open where you can talk to people. Okay, if we go back to the site again, okay, we know what the things are we have to look at. We know the bid date. We know the period deadline date, things like that. So it's all pretty good. All right, now let's get to the easy part of it. Let's say that your buyer has seen the property, you've shown it, you like it, you wanna make an offer on it. You're right in before the deadline. You're gonna click on this link right here and submit bid. By the way, the HUD home store site is the only place that you can submit a bid on a HUD property. You do not use car contracts. You do not send a bid to the listing agent. You have to bid online right here. You're gonna to have to register again or log in again. I'm gonna go into the selling broker, plug in my name. Plug in my license. Check that I'm not a robot, uh, believes that I am. So we're gonna find out, click on the CAPTCHA Palm trees. Okay, verify NAID. Now, what you're looking at right now is the HUD contract in its entirety, which again, makes it a very, very easy process. The list price is $265,000. Let's say for today, we're gonna to offer 265. Now, one real quick note on this, if it's listed at 265, but you know the market in that neighborhood is at 300 and you've gone to show the property and you're waiting in line to get into it like you are in most assets in Southern California right now, keep in mind that this is just the starting bid and make your offers accordingly. If the property is truly worth $300,000 and your client wants it, be advised you may wanna consider if the comps will support it offering the $300,000. Yes, you may have to pay, you may have to do a changeover and get them, you'll have appraisal issues, but a lot of times right now, we're seeing lenders even waiving appraisal requirement. We had two of those last week. But let's say for today, we're gonna to offer $265,000. We're gonna apply for conventional FHA financing, 203B, since this one is an insured property. Line five is the big one. This is what gets people tripped up. Seller pay reasonable and customary costs, but not more than actual costs, nor more than paid by a typical seller in the area. What does this mean in HUD speak? This means that HUD's not gonna pay anything except for recording of the deed and drawing of the deed. They're not gonna pay escrow fees. They're not gonna pay commission. They're gonna pay commissions. They're not gonna pay escrow fees, title insurance, transfer tax, anything that is a normal expense. All of those are gonna be on the buyer side of the equation, including the seller's fee. So your buyer's gonna pay the lender's title insurance and the seller's title insurance. They'll be paying the transfer tax, city and county if they both apply. They'll also be paying both sides of the escrow. So you can average probably about 2% more in closing costs than on a normal transaction. If your buyer is short on cash and you need that money, this is where you ask for it. So let's say they need $3,000. You put it in here. HUD will pay up to $79.50. If you want to get the full 3%, you can ask for it. I always recommend if you're asking for it, add it to the price up here. And that way you come out with the same net because at $3,000, this is the 246. This is the only number that HUD looks at and they're making of a decision. They're not gonna look at anything about the buyer's qualification. They're not gonna look at a buyer love letter. All they look at is the net to HUD when they make the bid selection. So if we need $3,000, we may wanna offer 268 
asked for the three, and now we've got the net is higher again, 248,920. The other thing you can do if you wanna sweeten up the deal, and I've gotten offers accepted a lot of times by doing this, is let's say that your buyer needs, wants to increase their offer, but can't really pay more. Maybe you can give them a little bit. So let's say if we drop our commission to $7,000, you'll see we just increased the net to HUD. Anytime you do a commission reduction on the HUD transaction, the commission reduction does not go to the buyer in terms of cash payment, but it goes to the seller to reduce the, to increase the net on the offer. On this case, if we go down here, we can't check anything else but owner occupant because this property is available exclusively and that means owner occupants only. You will need to check this box. It won't let you go forward if you do. These are came about last year. Is any purchaser any way related to HUD or anything to do with HUD? Check no. Is a selling broker submitting this offer taking an ownership interest in the property? Yes or no? If he is, check yes. The only thing is that HUD will not pay a commission to a selling broker now on their own purchases. So let's say no. Here's the best part of it right here. All that HUD needs from you, from your buyer, is their social security number, their name, the address, and their email, and a cell phone. Where it says phone right here, cell phone, we always put the cell phone number here because that's what uh, DocuSign links it to. You can add up to, I believe, four buyers on this if you need to do it. You can also add and remove purchasers once the contract has been rat you know, ratified or selected. The buyer closing agent information goes in here. Um, like for example, I, I a lot of times people use title companies. So let's say Chicago title, okay? Chicago title will pop up. All their information will auto-populate, including choice of the escrow officer and their title ID number. Let's use a different one that I've used before. Okay, Behringer escrow, then what would happen is my title, my escrow officer would pop up automatically. And then this is the last thing on the contract. Make sure that the signatory information is correct because you as a selling agent do not set, you do not sign the contract. You get one shot to review it, but all the signatures on the contract will be either your broker or the buyers, the asset management company and the escrow. Um, you as an agent will not sign the contract. So make sure that the information for the broker or designated signatory is correct. Now, once you have a contract that's been accepted, you'll be directed to go back to the HUD home store site and you'll be putting information in there. So I'm gonna go here real quick and go back to home and once you receive an accepted bid notice, you're gonna go back to the HUD home store site and click on accepted bids. Then you'll be stepped through a process where you'll upload the buyer's proof of funds. You're gonna upload a pre-qualification letter. Make a note on the pre-qual, that letter must contain the property address, the buyer's name, and the type of financing that they're applying for. Anything other than that's gonna be kicked back. Proof of funds, make sure that it has enough money for the down payment and the closing costs. Make sure that you blacked out any pertinent information such as you know personal information like bank statements, things like that. If this is going to be a gift, make sure that you have a donor letter and you have a bank statement from the donor that you can upload with it. You're also gonna be required to obtain from the escrow company, a copy of their license and a copy of their E&O insurance. That'll have to be uploaded at the same time. You'll also review for accuracy, the buyer's names, the spellings, the social security. You will add or remove buyers at that point and then you'll submit once that is all uploaded and done and the broker who is listing the property has received a copy of the cashier's check, then you'll be starting the DocuSign loop to get the contract signed. And they mentioned it briefly on the cashier's check for the deposit. Make sure that, that is payable to the escrow company and then deliver it to the listing broker. The listing broker has to submit copies of the cashier's check before the asset management company will forward the process for the ratification of the contract. Okay. 
Uh, one of the things pretty cool on this that I like too, going back to the HUD home store site, is bid results. If you didn't get the bid, the only reason you didn't get it was you either didn't offer enough or you asked too much in closing costs. And I know buyers find it hard to believe even when you tell them what you need to offer, and they still like to believe Zillow, things like that. HUD actually gives you a very cool tool to go back and use. They will tell you what the property sold for. So if we take a look at this, uh, this one in Riverside, for example, on Reggie, an investor bought it. The net to HUD was 297,568. So if you'd been following this or you made an offer on the property, then you would know that this is what I would have had to offer by taking the offering price, subtracting out the commission at 6% and maybe any closing cost to determine what the net was. So this is a good tool to go back and show buyers if they didn't get it, this is what they would have had to make made an offer on to get it. Now, the reason I like this is that 50 or 60% of the time, the HUD property falls out of escrow. And once that happens, anybody that submitted an offer is going to have a chance to bid again. HUD will notify you that the property is coming back on the market. And now you'll have known what it sold for the first time. So that's a pretty cool tip right there. Okay, so we've got bid results. Um, there's not much else on here. We know that these things don't work. We know how to search. If you can't sleep some night, you can start clicking on these links and this will give you about five and a half years worth of mundane reading material to help you sleep from here on out. So anything and everything you ever wanna know about HUD is here. Um, a lot of times you can find information if you're asking, if you're looking for it here, if we can't find the HUD selling broker's handbook, and you'll be able to find the information here just by clicking on these links. HUD help is a good one. And you can see here, it gives you all kinds of information on it. Okay, and that's really all I have at this point on it. We don't have a lot of inventory to take a look at. We know basically how we apply and put our information in to get our certification. So we can submit offers on HUD properties. We know how to search and we know how to submit offers. Is there anything else that we have questions on that you guys want to either unmute yourself and ask or want to put something in the chat box or anything the other brokers want to um, kick in? I see we have about six questions on chat. I think chat is current right now. Okay. Are there any other unanswered questions out there? Feel free to unmute yourself. This is a little shorter version of what we're usually providing, but we don't have a asset manager <coughs> website to go to, to take you to yet. So next month, that'll probably be corrected. Any burning questions before we wrap it up? Nope. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. You get a few more minutes uh, in your morning. Go get yourself an extra cup of coffee before you go to lunch or something. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Right. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time, thank Laura. You. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Laura.